Hello, everybody. Can you guys see me? That's weird. I had to let you into the room. All right, so uh, you guys can test uh, if you have sound and if yeah, I can hear you. And we will start in 10 minutes. But in the meantime, the room is open. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. You can hear me? Good. Yes. Sounds good. I will check. Yeah, so I will resume. All right. So who is doing first presentation? Uh, we uh, requirements spec group. Group group number one requirements specification. All right. So let's. Okay, I'm sharing to my screen now. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, cool. I guess we'll start. Um, Okay, so we are group one. We're doing the requirement specification for phase one right now. And we come up with the, a name for the app. Uh, we call this secure box. Um, and uh, for this phase, we have six members in total. Johanne, Hokum, uh, Lars, Ruyang, Mei, Ao, and Su Ying, Ying Sun. Um, for the agendas today, we're going to talk about the team process. And uh, second, we're going to talk about the protocols that we chose, and we also ranked them. So that is it's easier for the technical spec team to choose among the protocols. Shortly, we're going to talk about the functional requirements and non-functional non requirement. And then finally, we're going to walk you through the user interface that we come up with. All right. So, so far, we have a meeting every week on Thursday from 12 to 14. Uh, and we use Discord as our communication tool. So uh, usually before the pandemic thing happened, we meet face-to-face uh, -face at the campus. And we discussed uh, all of the questions in the uh, that, that is posted on the wiki, and then we vote on it. Um, we laid out all of the, of the pros and cons of each um, questions, and then we vote as a group. And then every decisions that are made uh, are recorded in the technical draft document. Um, and every all the, of the new members who are joined uh, later than who is not joined in the first few meeting are updated as soon as they join about the process and how. And what uh, have we decided already? And also our report and presentation are divided equally between the members. Um, so we let everybody choose um, what they want to work on. And also uh, me as a project leader, so I always uh, remind and give feedback to my teammates throughout the, the whole phase. And now that we come here, uh, now we're going to talk about the technical thing. Uh, Ru? Yeah. Uh, I, can, can I have a question during the yeah. presentation? Yeah, 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 sure. So uh, apart from Discord, what other electronic tools do you use, for example, for writing up and for decision making and so on? Uh, we use uh, Google Docs. And mm -hmm. uh, for UI is making, um, using, uh, we're using Figma. Uh, and for diagrams, I think we use a bunch of other things like XMind or 
uh, Google Draw or something. I just want to say that we also use Overleaf towards the end yeah. to write the report to make it look nice. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK. okay. Uh, I will go into introduce the protocols. First, uh, is uh, it's Tox. Uh, Tox makes uh, no attempt to cloak your IP address when communicating with friends. As the whole point of a peer to peer network is uh, to connect you directly to your friends. However, a non friend user cannot, cannot easily discover your IP address using only a Tox ID. You will reveal your IP address to someone only when you add them to your contacts list. Uh, the picture on the right side is uh, a reference implementation of the protocol, and it is published as free and open source software in GitHub. Okay, the next slide. Okay, the next uh, protocol we have uh, selected is a uh, bit message. Uh, bit message uh, it uses it uses a public key encryption. But uh, like for example, when you send an email to someone, it will mix it with all other emails being sent, which makes it pretty much impossible for anyone in the middle to figure out uh, from where the email was sent. They also don't have information as, the, as to the receiver of the email. So each individual message contains the data from every other message that's not going through bit, bit message. The receiver's key, however, only retrieves the messages that was intended for hey or her inbox. Yeah, the next one. Us? Yeah, uh, so uh, the last option we have considered is uh, a composite solution built on top of uh, established standards. It's uh, inspired by an application called uh, Yami, which uses uh, the SIP, Session Initiation Protocol, and DHT uh, combined with the uh, TLS uh, to secure uh, communication channel. Uh, the SIP protocol is uh, also used in Skype for Business, among other applications. Um, addressing is uh, utilizing DHT, which uh, exists as an open source project, open DHT on GitHub. And it's uh, typically using a 40 digit uh, hex string as addresses. And depending on implementation, this can could preferably be masked behind more friendly usernames. There's also an SIP API in Android, which is pretty good, I think. Yeah, functional requirements. <clears throat> we have provided requirements in two forms, functional requirements and use cases. Uh, so the functional requirements are just a list of operations in the system while the use cases describe these operations in more detail. So now we'll give an overview of our use cases. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> the individual user is the main actor in our use cases. It's the individual private end user uh, of the application. Uh, so we divided the use cases into some categories. Uh, Sorry, the um, uh, basic functionalities such as uh, uh, account related ones, uh, just to get those out of the way. And then we have uh, various things like searching for other users, blocking and unblocking them. We, we usually have operations to, uh, if we have an operation to create, we also have one to delete or undo. Uh, we have friend requests so that we um, 
<laughs> there's a concept of friend lists between users and uh, friendships are always mutual so we can uh, so a user can send a friend request to another user that they have searched for uh, they can b before the friend request has been uh, replied to by the other user they can cancel it and then the other user can either accept or decline it or just ignore it of course um, uh, let, but just uh, let's go back to the search for a user. This depends, of course, on what kind of addresses we are using to identify users with. We we want to. Uh, they are of course going to have a unique address, but they should also have a non-unique nickname, which is more readable and user friendly. So, uh, in the app, we should be able to, uh, or users should be able to to search for either type or string in order to find matching users. <clears throat> uh, all users also have a personal avatar. By default, we we just decided they should have a, um, a, a do you know gravatar? Uh, gen um, a randomly generated generic avatar. But they also have the options to upload their own uh, image. And then they should be able to remove it so that it reverts to the gravatar default. Uh, and then for the more uh, the more uh, important part of the application, we have two types of uh, chat chat channels. We just call them chats, individual and group chats. Individual are one to one; they are direct chats between two friends. While group chats are um, a group of up to 100 members, we decided. Uh, in the group chat, they don't, not all two members have to be friends, but uh, when you create the group, a group chat, you invite any number of your own friends. We don't have a restriction that all these friends then should be friends. That's not necessary, we decided. Um, We have a difference between, uh, we have distinction between clearing and deleting an individual chat, which will also, um, that's, that'll be on the, on the next slide. It also applies to group chats. Uh, when you clear an individual chat, you uh, delete all the message history data on your device. The purpose of this is to, is to free up space. Uh, and when you delete it, that's when you actually delete the chat so that you can't continue chatting. Uh, which is something we had to do because of the uh, uh, decentralized, uh, because everything is stored on your own device, on the user's device. Uh, as for group chats, you can create, a, one user can create a group chat by inviting any number of their friends, but they can also take an individual chat and invite any number of their friends to that just for convenience. And when I do that, a new, it's just a different way of creating a new group chat. Uh, mm, without going into too much detail. <clears throat> Let's see, when, yeah, when, when a user creates a group chat and invites their friends, their friends then have the option to join. They can also decline. And when we also decided that when a user joins, they should be able to see the uh, message history from before they joined. All right, next slide, please. Yeah, so, so I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you you mentioned that the users have unique identifier and a nickname, which may or may not be unique. Yes. So if I got a request from um, a particular person, how do I know? that they are the person who they say they are. Uh, so my question is, how do I establish this sort of a trusted relationship with someone if I don't know if that Nick actually belongs to my friend or to somebody pretending to be my friend? Uh, I imagine that you'll be able to see both the unique uh, non-unique nickname and the unique identifier. The, 
the nickname is just for convenience for being able to search so you don't have to type in the whole address when you search uh, and that's what i imagine at least when you search for a nickname you will you um, see all the matches and then you also see the the unique addresses for each so that you'll be able to find the right one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay um so then i would need to communicate with my friends about the unique ids so then i can verify that they are really the friends i want to connect with mm -hmm. right yes yeah okay so <clears throat> about the group chat so one sub uh, subtype of the user is a group member uh, as uh, johanna said before the group member can uh, leave a chat or clear a group chat so before they leave the group chat or they can delete the group chat forever after they left the group so the group member is uh, invited or joined in a group chat another type of user is group owner so the group owner first can invite the user to a group chat or uh, another one is they can prompt a uh, promote a group member to a group owner and also they can kick a group member out of the group chat also about the group avatar they can also uh, the group the group owners can also upload or remove the group chat and the last one is um uh dismiss a group chat so if the group owner want to dismiss a group chat the original group owner want to dismiss a group chat and uh, whether there are group owners other group owners they can still dismiss a group chat if they want and they can choose to leave a group chat based on there is other group owners in that group chat and after the group owner left the group chat they can delete a group chat yes next please Yes, so when it comes to non-functional requirements, uh, there are a couple, but not too many. First of which is that uh, due to the very simple nature of the, uh, of the app, it shouldn't really have a high minimum requirement since it's more or less just a messaging app. Um, as a result, it should also have a very high grade of reliability due to its simplicity. and capable of uh, being on a large scale deployment with thousands of users. Um, in addition to this, uh, uh, there should be a rigorous testing phase to ensure that all of these points are up to a relatively premium standard. Um, and then for safety, there is uh, the login and logout system, which uh, requires user information, so that should be handled in a privacy-oriented manner, uh, which also means that the user should feel safe when they send their messages and that they log in, and that those are safe from the public, so that no one else can view them. Uh, in terms of maintainability, uh, the code should be uh, very descriptive with headers and uh, comments uh, clearly indicated in the code. Uh, and when it comes to portability, the app should be able to support both uh, Android and iOS. And yeah, next slide. Okay, uh, now we're going to show you the user interface. Okay. 
Okay, so the first two screen is for user sign in and register, registration. And once the user have signed in, they will go to the conversation page as the default page. As, as you say, this is the original screen where there's no conversation. And you have a button here to start a new conversation with someone. And this is the list of conversation, if there's any. And this is like the um, individual chat. It is by the person name and then some message that they sent. And if you send something, it will display here as well. And it will also display the last time when the last message was uh, sent or received. And if it's a group, then whoever chat will display, will have a short uh, preview of their message here. And this is when you tap the search icon here, it will prompt you to the search screen where you can search for friends or conversation. Um, and if you type some kind of username that doesn't exist in your friend list, it will automatically go to prompt to the global search. And it will search for users uh, with the same, uh, with the, the matching username depends on the ID that you use, uh, that we use, of course. And this is a user, pro a user profile. So if you find a um, person and then you can click the button here to send the a friend request and it will change to this um, icon. And you can tap it again to cancel your friend request or you can go directly to their profile where it will have a section that you send to uh, that is to inform you that you send a friend request to this person and you can cancel that as well. And this is just an info section of the user. Um, and they, uh, it will also display if there's any group uh, that you two are in together and you have a button here to start a conversation with this uh, person as well. Um, See. This is your profile. Uh, for example, if you click here on this uh, menu icon here, you will be prompted to this drawer where you can create a new group. You can build your profile, you can build your friend list and some settings. We don't know what's inside the settings yet. Uh, it's just there. And then you can also log out. As for the friend list, you can see all of your friends here, and then you can also see the friend request uh, that uh, you received. And when you go into this page, you see all the friend requests and you can accept or decline them. And if you accept it, it will uh, disable the button, but it still keep your decisions until you move away from the screen and you come back and then it will of the uh, accepted or declined uh, request will be uh, gone and it will only display the, the one that is sent. And uh, when you click on a person profile here, there's a section that inform you that this person sent you a friend request and you can also accept or decline there. And uh, the rest is the same with, um, with the user profile that I showed you before. And um, when you um, tap on this uh, options icon, you can click and uh, you can also add a stranger as a friend or unfriend them if they are a friend. Uh, and they can, you can also block that users if they bother you or something. Okay. And this is the conversation screen. It's quite uh, simple. And uh, here you have the options to create a group from the individual chat, clear the history or delete the chat. And um, if you choose to create a group, it will prompt you to add a create group screen where you can create new group. Uh, you can add members. And the limit of a group is uh, 100 people. And then you must enter the group name this is uh, mandatory it's not optional then you just click tap on this button to confirm and then the group will be created 
And this is uh, so once you uh, create a group, then all of the other people will see this group in their conversation list, like uh, this one, like this. They can see the group here. But when they click on the group, uh, on the group, they can actually have the option to either join it or not. Uh, so if they tap in join group, they will join into the group and then you can see the messages. Um, and in the group, you as a member, you can uh, clear history or leave the group. And uh, if you tap on this uh, group name at, on the toolbar on the top, you can go to the group profile uh, and you can see the group name, the group avatar and uh, to the total members of the group. You can click here to add members, which will prompt you to this option on the available if you're an admin. And clicking on add member will prompt you to the, the select member screen like this. And you can see all of the members in the group and uh, you can either make a person an admin or remove that person from the group. And whoever is the um, is the admin will have a star beside the name like this. So it's easier to uh, distinguish. And if you are just, uh, you can also dismiss group as a group owner, but as a normal member of the group, you can only see the members and then you can just leave the group. You don't have any other options. And that's about it for the user interface. Do you have any questions? And that's the end of our uh, presentation as well. So. Uh, I have um, I have some questions. So the admin and owner are the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. The owner and the admin is the same thing. Yeah. So if the group has only one admin and the admin leaves the group, can the admin leave the group if it's only one? Uh, we don't think the admin can leave the group if there's only one. They have to promote somebody else as the group owner first before they can leave. Okay. Um, if there are multiple admins and one of the admins decides to delete the group, um, is it okay or so? So th there are two concepts. So one concept is deleting the group from the local device, right? Mm -hmm. And the other concept was I forgot. Was it this? Uh, dismiss the group. Dismiss the group. Yeah. So dismissing the group means the kind of a uh, un like. Uh, deleting it like from the system itself right yeah yeah so if there's one of the admins decides to this um this uh what was it again dismiss dismiss yeah to dismiss the group is it possible or, or all the admins should agree to the dismissal we think it's possible but uh fun we haven't really thought about it but uh for now. for now, for now, I think uh, the original group of the the next be. phase, maybe we can come up with a, like a voting system for the admins. Okay. Like if a person chooses to dismiss a group, then they will have to wait for the other admins to agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm just asking because I've been um, in in some of the multiplayer games. You can have uh, you can promote people to a group. Uh, kind of manager and then sometimes you get a person to do bad things like uh, I was in a group which promoted uh, a person to be a group manager and then this person kicked everybody out of the group right um, and that was unintentional like uh, it was not uh, I mean it was intentional for this person to do that but that wasn't the um, desirable outcome so it would have been better if some of the actions are mediated by other admins, which they say, oh, look, 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 that's, you should not do that, right? Um, so maybe you could consider um, dismiss it, dismissal of the group to be a very serious action. And if there are multiple admins, maybe majority or some sort of negotiation should take place. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe a single admin should not be able to make such a big decision on top of the group. Um, I have another question related to the group size. How did you come up with the restriction of 100 users only? Well, because uh, at first uh, we check uh, 
the others have uh, for their group limit. Mm -hmm. Some doesn't have, but some have around like um, 20,000 limit, which is quite a lot. So for the first phase, I don't think we can handle much traffic. So uh, we're just gonna go with the 100 first and then we can, we'll see how the technical side come up with their uh, decisions and then we can uh, scale it up or down, depends on their decisions on the tech. Okay. Um, so th there are two aspects to it. So one aspect is like a technology and technical limitations of scaling and so on. Uh, which is fair enough. And then the other aspect is the semantics or the, um, the group behavior based on the size of the group. So for example, if I have a group of 1000 people, then none single member can really manage the, um, the, the group sort of um, dynamics it, it's a it's a different dynamics to say a group which is 100 people so groups uh there is a research which suggests that we can manage kind of a membership or gr group belonging to groups up to 150 people at mm -hmm. which point it breaks down so nobody is able to manage uh kind of a group memberships more than 150 some people cannot even do that, but at least those who are very capable can do that. Um, the incapable ones are probably even smaller number than that, uh, but nobody can really manage groups beyond that limit. So it might be that semantically groups of thousand people or more and groups of hundred or less are kind of different. They have a different dynamics because you have kind of a different belonging or different um, Kind of a semantic meaning to the concept of a group so that's something you could consider also yeah of course. Uh, um i have one question also in relation to your users which have a phone number um and i was wondering how you envision a validation of the phone number to be legitimate um, actually, this uh, information is just there for mockups. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you don't necessarily want users to provide a phone number. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because you didn't mention it before. You mentioned the unique ID and the nickname. Yeah, it's just for mockups. So. Yeah. One other thing is in your profile, you show a user's belonging to groups. Mm -hmm. so you think um so what do you think about this feature so if um if you click on a user then you s immediately see all the groups that user belongs to not uh not all the groups that they belong to but only the groups that they uh, that 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 user and you are in together i see okay so and those are only groups. shared groups the ones which you share yeah so that's why i say hey, you are not in any group together okay 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 perfect yeah that that's well i understand it better now Okay, great. Yeah. Um, no more questions. I think it was a uh, very thorough and well done uh, review. Uh, small comment, like uh, it's it's not that it's not in in any sense negative, but um, some of your work kind of was a little bit onto the technical side, uh, so yeah, you didn't like have to do that, right? You you could leave it to the technical team to do that part of the work, but that's fine. I mean, you it's it's quite hard to to see the boundaries of where the requirements are kind of on the kind of as user side and which ones are on the technical side, and they are kind of mixed. So it's fine. Uh, I'm just saying that some of your analysis, especially on the protocol level, probably belongs more to the technical side of things, but that's fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we actually, it actually come up a lot in our discussions. We always ask each other, is this something we should do? Uh, should we leave it to the technical side? Yeah, exactly. So uh, like it's no, um, it's really hard to isolate those two aspects together entirely, uh, but um, but yeah, you did an excellent job. So it's it's really, really nice. I, I have one more thing though. Um, so because the system is peer to peer and because the system is decentralized and there is a notion of the, the, the trust, so to speak, 
So for example, uh, people can pretend to be someone else and they can create multiple accounts and it's a little bit tricky. Um, I was wondering how much can a user mark uh, so, so let's say I have a friend, um, Blue is my friend, and we hook up and I know Blue, my friend, is really Blue because I met her in person and we chatted and we kind of know each other. So I know, for example, that this unique ID is hers and that's all kind of done really well. Uh, for some things I need to do off, off, uh, of the system exchange. So I need to use another communicator to exchange the unique IDs to validate that a person is really who they say they are. So for example, I have Blue, which I really trust, and I validated her and I know she is who she is. And then I have another friend which with whom I exchange the unique ID with Skype and whatever. And then I have some friends which told me, oh yeah, my nickname is uh, Mariusz and you can just hook up with me. And I did, but I didn't, I am kind of not 100% sure if they really the, the person who they say they are, right? So I have certain trust levels and currently in your system, it's not, I, I cannot tag people. I cannot say with Blue, I did all these extra things to validate and I'm sure she is who she is. But with those other friends, I just looked them up and I invited them to, to, to kind of uh, be friends with, but I'm not 100% sure if they are real people I, I think they are. And in the UI at the moment, I cannot change, I, I cannot like say that, I cannot um, distinguish that. Uh, do you think that would be a good thing to have? Yeah, I think that, that's a, an excellent idea to add in the system. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I know more questions and no more comments, I guess, at that stage. Well done. So for the second group, who, who will be presenting? I, um, one second. I will try to share. Can you see it? Yes, it is working. Yeah, we see the presenter mode. All good. Um, um, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, we were the um, technical specification group and the members in our group were um, the group leader was Akif Kadus and uh, my name is Salman and we have Oscar, Andre, Niklau and Kai in our group. So um, the method we used to uh, communi uh, communicate with each other was that we made a Facebook, uh, Facebook messenger group and where we were available mostly and we discussed every day, everything there and whenever we thought we, ha we needed to have a meeting we sh we came up with the time when everyone was av available and we had a meeting. So now moving on to the next slide, Andre, can you? Oh. Okay, so uh, uh, um, our first thing was that we needed to choose the best technology between these three, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi Direct. And we needed to see what um, there were what positives and what negatives these things had, and which was the best technology used for our um, applications. So um, these are some basic definitions. Like Bluetooth is a wireless technology standard used for exchanging data between fixed and mobile devices over short distance using short wavelength radio waves in in an in, in the industry and scientific medical radio bands, and to make a personal area network and then we have Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a wireless network technology that uses radio waves to produce, provide wireless high speed internet and network connection and then we have Wi-Fi Direct is a um, is a is also a peer-to-peer -peer wireless connection that allows two devices to establish a direct Wi-Fi connection without any 
wireless access point and these all had some trade offs um, andre can you move to the next slide um and um, speed um, um bluetooth speed of transferring data from one device to another is not fast when you compare it to wifi and wifi direct it is too slow so wifi and wifi direct will be um, will will be your choice if you want to per, if you want a product that can transfer data very quickly Wi-Fi Direct has one advantage over Wi-Fi as well that it does not require any assessment so it can transfer just like Bluetooth with Wi-Fi speed and the other is range. Um, um, sim um, simple Bluetooth range is not as much as compared to Wi-Fi and direct Wi-Fi. The range is mostly up to 50 feet of a Bluetooth device but this can increase using a mesh network which can be a little bit of complex so the range uh, but uh, after doing that the range can go up to 3000 feet wi-fi and wi-fi direct have more range than simple bluetooth device and the range can be like 250 feet now akip Kadush will continue uh okay so uh coming toward the power uh the thing is if you want higher speed and uh, longer transmission range and uh, then obviously it will drain more power so uh, in this particular case, Bluetooth is a clear winner than Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi Direct uh, because it requires less power. Uh, but as it requires less power, it also drains less battery too. Um, so if the thing is, it was primary, uh, primarily developed for Internet of Things application, which many times need to run from a small single watch battery. And as we know that usually uh, Internet of Things, the, th uh, the things which are connected together are uh, located closely with each other. And usually the network is small. So for those kind of uh, applications, Bluetooth uh, is a suitable choice. Um, but as we are developing the chat application, although Bluetooth requires less power, uh, but it uh, might not be a very suitable choice because we could have a uh, number of users that can go up to, uh, I mean, in hundreds or even thousands. Uh, coming towards the compatibility, uh, the thing is if you want a product which can interact with all the other devices, either old or new, the Bluetooth can be the best option uh, because it is mostly in all the devices. Uh, old devices mostly don't have Wi-Fi and direct Wi-Fi, so it depends if you want to interact with the new devices. Uh, like your focus is to build an application only for the uh, uh, new devices, then Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi Direct can be a more suitable option as new products. Uh, I mean, mostly all of them have this feature now. Um, one of the most important aspect is the security and privacy. So Bluetooth as compared to Wi-Fi is less secured and uh, because Bluetooth uses an encryption and authentication keys, uh, which is only 128 bit, uh, while Wi-Fi uh, has better security and it uses 256 bit encryption key. And Wi-Fi also uses wide equivalency privacy and Wi-Fi protected access. Uh, talking uh, about the can, I, can I uh, interrupt for a second? There was a request that we have a break from uh, 11 to 11:15. 11 uh, so let's let's have a break and then we continue from from the uh, from 11:15 uh, onwards. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I will pause the recording and then we resume at 11:15. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Yes. Back. All right. So let's let's resume. Okay. Uh, can I see it? Yes, we can uh, see the presenter mode of your slides again. It's all good. Yes. Okay. So. Um, uh, about my part, last but not the least, we have performance impl implication. Uh, Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi Direct have better performance and are a little more reliable than Bluetooth. Uh, they have also better speed 
and have large larger range as well as compared to the bluetooth uh talking about the bandwidth uh, the bandwidth of bluetooth is lower as compared to wi-fi and wi-fi direct so overall um wi-fi direct and wi-fi uh, could be the better choice for for this particular application oops uh are you done okay yes okay well that's a lot of text but uh, uh i'll talk about um versus like um different approaches and networks um basically of um that we could um, adopt in our project well we have to keep in mind that our project is it cares a lot about privacy and a so it should be decentralized mostly and it also should um should be an uh, anonymous and yeah uh, so there are two approaches the the and the question i started i started with the ruben spokes versus uh point to point and well point to uh, ruben spokes are, is centralized and requires uh it has some advantages like it requires fewer roads uh, uh it has a root uh, roads scalability is the order of n and n being the number of uh, nodes it reduces um work for nodes and put uh it put and it, it and put it in into the the hub there are some packages sorting and other uh, processing that uh, it's really it, it, the hub does that and the hub is a central structure that um that forward and guy how to say this route a and, and how, route um packages into the network um and the this uh the the now the downside is that the distance traveled by per road will be more usually and therefore the efficiency may, may be reduced it's just, it is centralized which is uh, what we want to avoid in this project in this develop uh, this project this software and it's hard to handle high demand uh the scalability of this uh the, this is this network it relies on the hub um and it, ha it has a single point of failure uh, attribute like uh if if the hub is down uh basically their whole network is down as well um or if it's like a lot of traffic it's it's lower uh, so usually uh now i'll talk about uh, point to point it usually reduces travel time it is not centralized what which is what we search with for project uh it's robust because if you i mean it it relies on the not centralized thing uh if if you one node is down the network is still working so uh it's it's not sensible for censorship because it's not centralized so you there's not an entity that can control which which if your package will be delivered or not and it is scalable um about based on the network and there are some downsides uh the it's the order n2 power of two routes um it's hard to control what goes in the network it could be considered a downside uh and there are some processing in the hubs like package, package sorting as i said and this could be a issue for the mobile web because there's some processing for the hub uh, for the nodes so it could be slower uh, then i got the so we decided to adopt the point point to point approach for this specific uh, project so we got the peer-to-peer -peer versus client server uh, approach uh, and we well the client server is easy to update and check security data of security of data and it's easy to to track the creator of the data um, it is centralized 
uh, no control of uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's centralized, uh, no control over data. Uh, and clients can, can ask for ser services, but not uh, give services. So only the server works as a server. And on the other hand, in the peer-to-peer, -peer, the nodes could work as a uh, pro service providers as well. So it, this causes a server of overload. It may cause a server overload. Uh, the performance relies on the server structure only. So the now the peer-to-peer -peer approach is more robust because it's not centralized. It has high av availability because if uh, you want to get one data from the network, it could be in different uh, nodes. So if one node's down, there are others that could provide that which wouldn't be possible in the client server if the server is down. Yeah, you can't get your data or service. Uh, it's not possible to identify the creator, creator of the, uh, the data, which is the, really important for anonymity. Uh, the, prefers, the performance does not uh, rely only in the, in the server. It relies on the, the, not the network. And there are some kind of uh, networks that could handle this kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer approach with cryptographic, cryptography, and cryptographic, and and also this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, approach. One I found I found interesting was the zero, zero net, which is free it's uh, open source and it was really i i, f I found it really easy uh, friendly uh, user friendly and simple and uh, okay so peers as trust or for not so you rely on p uh, you have to trust the peers which can be issue in this kind of uh, network uh, bugs in the peer-to-peer -peer could imply vulner vulner vulnerabilities to the user, and there is is and there is the an, an unnecessary large amount of network traffic because we have to flow flood the the data through the network, so it could it creates some unnecessary traffic, and there is some pro it could have some problems with DD, DDoS uh, poisoning. I mean, I'm sorry, DDoS attacks through index poisoning, but uh, it, this could be partially resolved with uh, the structure of the peer-to-peer, uh, the structure of the peer-to-peer -peer, um, network. And it's, uh, yeah, uh, we chose the partial centralized, but I'll go there. Uh, yeah. mm, so peer-to-peer uh, -peer topology. Uh, there are different uh, topologies of peer to peer. There is a truly centralized, de decentralized one, which uh, every peer is a server client with a list of uh, neighbors. It has a, uh, every time you want to send or get something, you have to float the network until you get it. And it has some problem because we have the time to leave uh, in the package. So if you, if you are, if you are, message you want to get it and it has to do i don't know 20 jumps to to get your message and in the time to leave it's 19 you won't get it uh, so it you you could not get your data even though it is in the network but usually when it's really distant um well the partial partially centralized it has some super nodes that hold a hash table with the address of the of nodes in the network um, it has no no floating, therefore it has a better it's better scalable. It actually it's uh, it reduces a lot. Basically, it, uh, can depending of the way you structure it, it could reduce uh, reduce the time to leave problem. And if it, and there is a it could handle like uh, there is a, a small problem because you kind of centralized the P, the super node. But and so if it fails, you could couldn't get your index. You couldn't uh, know where to get your data. But it can handle this because uh, if a super node fail, it can be replaced by another node. Um, 
and there is the hybrid approach where there is a central server storing um, metadata or of nodes and files. It is centralized and therefore it has all those problems like it's unscalable, it's vulnerable, and, and true censorship is technically uh, technically failure, uh, sensible, and or malicious attack. And it's less robust since it's centralized. So we chose the partial, partially centralized approach for this. Can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Uh, so my task was uh, the next, the following the task was to, to uh, think about the, the routing algorithms to use, uh, where the traffic should go, how, where does it flow, how do we find out how it flows, and how to hide that uh, from attackers that they can't make use of the information or that they can't actually get the information in the first place. Um, it, it was a bit... bit difficult to uh, to do that because as the network uh, topology and the layout is not set uh, in the current state of the project uh, we went went on and got some um, some different routing algorithms and protocols that uh, implemented protocols that uh, could be used where on different types of networks um uh, i've uh, put them in the in the uh, report that we wrote uh that will be in the repo uh, later on um do you want me to go into more details which uh protocols we chose uh for now uh or do they do you think that is that is not necessary no if you could briefly yeah go over the protocols that would be helpful okay then uh, let me just look up the the document okay here um so because uh, I was not sure if it's even going to be a P2P network in the first place. I've got also some for mesh and ad hoc networks, some uh, routing algorithms. Uh, the first uh, one would be, and uh, don't don't uh, uh, force me on the pronunciation, GNU Teller routing, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, or the at a similar style of routing because that is actually a network implementation uh, and, uh, and the, the group peer to peer network that has been up and running for quite some time now, I think roughly 20 years. Um, it's a really uh, easy to set up and to use a uh, type of peer to peer network uh, that comes with uh, some drawbacks, of course, because it is very simple to use and to set up. Uh, therefore, uh, on on a smaller scale, there's a, a slight problem with getting into the network because to get into the network, you need to know any node that is already in the network, which can be problematic if you're like a new person and none of your friends have uh, the, uh, the messenger and you want to introduce them to it and then you can't join uh, as well you need to know somebody to get into it that is a, a problem that could be fixed and also that after the first connection uh, to introduce you to the other parts of the uh, network uh, you would the the rotor protocol introduces flooding uh uses flooding so that gets uh not as useful uh, when the uh, network grows in size. So on a large scale network, flooding is not the best, probably not the best option to use. Um, yeah, so that that type of routing and network would not be a good choice if we want to go for a larger scale. But it's a, it's an easy and simple setup and use uh, version. The other thing, of course, as we already discussed it in the lectures, are distributed hash tables that, of course, can also be used by 
uh, there I've just put in some uh, implementations that could be used or, or go, could give an uh, example on how to to implement uh, the 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 HTs. Um, the next one I thought we thought about is uh, semantic routing. That is a uh, query type routing uh, method. Uh, so it directs uh, users queries whether when they search for something like a destination or a route, uh, they it selects uh, specific servers uh, where uh, the the flood uh, the the uh, the search should be directed to. And the primary goal of semantic routing is um, the, to, to, the goal of it is to reduce the heavy traffic load that comes with large scale peer-to-peer -peer networks because there's a lot of traffic going on in them. Um, and the, the main tool that is used to do so is indexing. And as indexing, can also get very confusing and the index, uh, the indices get rather long and complicated. But on a large scale network, there's a, there are some uh, methods to it to reduce the overhead there. So if we are uh, have a run into a problem that a lot of traffic is going through the network and it's very crowdy and noisy that way, uh, then this type of routing could be useful. Then a short, uh, uh, short thing about uh, Freenet could also be used. Uh, it is a, a full, uh, well, complete anonymity, uh, an anonymity for the user. A peer to peer network that uh, ensures complete anonymity for the user, uh, but uh, that user descripted. Uh, distributed encrypted file system. So um, it stores data that is not necessarily yours uh, on your device. Uh, and therefore, the size that the application would take up, uh, would use in the, in the device would not be necessarily uh, correlating to the amount the user uses the application or has information stored in the application. Uh, which I personally think is not a good thing for uh, for uh, a messenger app. Uh, but on the other hand, it also it provides full anonymity for the user if that is uh, required. Uh, the next uh, algorithm is destination sequence distance vector routing, or DSDVC. As of course, I've put some links into it where you can the the group that follows up on this uh, can get a bit more more details on the, each of the uh, algorithms and protocols I've uh, described so far. That is a, a table-driven routing. So DSDVC is a, a table-driven routing algorithm, and it's a variation of distance vector routing. Uh, and the the main goal or the the main issue that this one addresses is loop avoidance so on low connect on uh, low connected networks uh, it's a, there's a problem that some uh, routing algorithms can run into loops where they don't find uh, uh, any solution to the to the routing problem and the main goal or the main task of this routing algorithm is that it it doesn't uh, run into these. Um, it also, therefore, to, to ensure that there, uh, it very regularly um, updates uh, the routing tables. Uh, and that's also uh, the biggest drawback of the whole algorithm, because there are very frequent updates. And therefore, there's a lot of traffic going on in the network just by default. Um, although no flooding is used, so uh, most of the, the changes that occur are only uh, presented locally to, to nearby other clients. 
uh, the traffic overall in the network is very locally focused, but so there are no long hops on the on the routing tables uh, updates, but on um, there are a lot of updates going on at any given time. Uh, the next one is dynamic source routing, uh, DSR. Uh, that uses a reactive approach. So uh, only when uh, only when a, a user wants to know a route to another user or th that one is needed, then a route is uh, will be established and not established, but uh, will be uh, located, uh, will be uh, thought through. Uh, so there's no flooding needed to create any sorts of tables because they are only reactive uh, approaches. So there's a minimum uh, usage of bandwidth just for keeping uh, the routing up to date because there is no need to keep the routing up to date because it's on demand. Uh, but yeah, that's also call, can cause some delay when the user wants to find somebody new on the network. Um, now, three more. Uh, ad hoc on-demand distance vector routing. Uh, that is very similar to the one I've just talked about to DSR. Um, and you also use a reactive dynamic approach. But uh, overall, it's very, very similar to the, to the one above. And then, and second last uh, zone routing protocol that is uh, a hybrid of pro and reactive routing protocol. Uh, this one uh, slices the network in zones and then uses different uh, routing protocols to uh, in each of these zones so that uh, in order to try to uh, apply the most appropriate type of routing to the specific uh, sub-network. And the last one is uh, hierarchy routing, HR. Uh, that this type of uh, routing ranks a different routers in the network um, in a hierarchical order so that uh, there are not as many uh, connections so that that what that means is um, the network also gets divided into regions, and then uh, the there are only a few connections between each region, and so there are not um, the individual router does not need to store as much information because it's only storing information about its region, and then the connecting points between the regions are storing some more data so that they know I am a connection point to region B. And the last thing we also want to, I talked uh, only a little bit about privacy with, with the routing protocols. Um, as it's really not set in stone what we are going to do uh, with it in, in the project in the current time. Um, maybe what could be achievable is like if we use uh, a table driven routing protocol, then it would be, could be possible to do them in an encrypted manner. That could be uh, done to obscure uh, the data to make it not as vulnerable. And of course, as we, are, that all, we already said that in the, the lectures, uh, if we have a very low traffic uh, network, then we should uh, create some fake traffic to obscure uh, connections or uh, traf traffic routes. Yeah, that's uh, for my part. Yes, uh, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, for the next part uh, about like uh, authentication algorithm and methods, how to acknowledge who is who and establishing trusted secure communication channels, 
Uh, first of all, uh, we of course have looked into public-private uh, key cryptography, um, specifically for uh, sending messages to recipients with knowing the public keys and encrypting it. So uh, we looked into uh, we looked into a few implementations here. We don't know like exactly what we're gonna go for either, like. Uh, React Native or Native Android or Flutter, but <clears throat> here are two examples. Uh, so one is an RSA React Native uh, implementation, which provides, uh, it's a library that provides uh, signing and verification uh, and random generation of public-private key pairs. Um, and on the other hand, also uh, EasyCrypt, which was a, uh, cryptography library for uh, Android, which uh, offers the same uh, functionality to some degree, if I understood it correctly, uh, with uh, RSA signing and verification. And RSA is basically just a public key encryption technology that is um, developed by some company called RSA Data Security. So, um, yeah, and for for um, like if we are going to have uh, somewhat centralized, partially centralized with hubs, it could be that we to some degree would like to uh, hide information that is not necessary. Um, like we don't want nodes to have a necessary amount of information conveyed to them unless it's needed. Uh, so we thought that maybe zero knowledge proof or CKP could be used uh, in these hubs uh, to just uh, describe that they they know some information that they need to know, but not like uh, convey it. I know we have had this basically in class, but I can just briefly go through. So zero knowledge proof is that uh, like in the image uh, on the presentation, Alice has two values and she knows the value of one of them. And Bob is allowed to switch uh, which hand the values is in. And then Alice can say, yeah, I know that the value is now in the left hand or the right hand. So basically that will tell that she knows the value, but she will not expose the value to Bob. Um, <clears throat> and then since we were not like sure about what technologies we would use or how centralized or decentralized we will be able to keep it. Uh, I also, we also like looked into some uh, implementations where they have uh, peers uh, I'd like verifying each other, but connecting through a server that makes the connection to them. Uh, so this is, this was just a like, uh, this p auth uh, uh, thing, which is an authentication protocol. It's a kind of minor paper, but it, it seemed to be useful if that was something that we were going for, uh, that we need, if we need to like uh, connect peers through like some centralized uh, points. So, <clears throat> Additionally, not I have not put it here, but in the report there are a uh, bit of talking about what technologies to look or techniques to look forward into. And uh, because we didn't have the requirement specification, so there are um, I've put up some links to um, some more overview uh, reports or uh, papers that gives an overview of, of the um, positives and negatives of different approaches or protocols when it comes to, to establishing <coughs> like a tr a secure communication channels. Um, one thing though that we thought about like for privacy at least, uh, there are some implications, uh, like there's trade-offs either way because you have to choose a way to identify that okay, this person is actually Alice. Uh, so we thought about like also if you could verify, for example, like WhatsApp does with phone number, but then again, that is exposed. Uh, but for now, like public private key pairing, 
that is probably one of the better ways to just solve it and you would have uh, or like the requirements group already said now that you have like this unique ID that could be linked to maybe a public address uh, but then again like a, all your actions or things you send will be linked to your public address too so it will always be some issues with uh, with privacy but that is like the trade-offs you have to go for yeah that is basically my part mm. uh, hello everyone uh, I am uh, on a train uh, heading to the Oslo so sorry for the noise before uh, any noise happens and uh, okay my question uh, my part is was about what libraries algorithms dependencies and implementations to use and it was kind of hard to decide on this because uh, we don't really have a like a clear region of requirements so i i try to be more general so that the the guys who are trying to implement it will have uh, better uh, options so and uh, also, I saw about the decentralized uh, messenger. So the most of the things will be done on your mobile app. So your focus or your priority is uh, should be when implementation is done is on a mobile app. So I I, I chose the three options uh, to develop your mobile app, and it's the, the first one is the React Native, uh, and it's um, kind of the open source and really popular at the moment i guess and uh you can you can develop uh, for the both uh android and ios uh with one uh source code so and uh, you have like easier language to develop javascript and uh, it's kind of uh, uh, more popular uh, among the uh, mobile app developers since uh, we have uh, i, I uh, it's not the research, but uh, I discussed this uh, with the a real uh, senior engineer at the SEO company, and uh, he he also works uh, on the net, uh, React Native for the uh, client projects. So it's kind of uh, my first priority. My it's my uh, so. But we have uh, two other options also um, about the Android. Uh, Android is the oldest probably open source uh, mobile application framework. Uh, with a long history and a lot of improvements uh, in a, a, a long time. And, and Android has a lot of uh, well-known uh, um, uh, libraries uh, like Glide, Retrofit, Butterknife, and JUnit. And um, so Android is kind of also the option for you. So the third one is the, the newest one, uh, Flutter. Um, and uh, it's uh, kind of uh, most up to date, uh, most uh, kind of um, how to say developed uh, by the Google, uh, with the experience from Android, uh, which is kind of competitor for the React Native. Um, uh, you can use it for the both Android and iOS with one source code, the same. And uh, the Flutter has the better uh, um, uh, design uh, options, like uh, uh, like they have a really good. Uh, uh, you can create really good flexible UI and the uh, APIs of the Flutter is uh, very consistent and everything there is like kind of widget. So they have a different strategy to develop mobile app. So, and, uh, but, but the Flutter is really new. I mean, uh, it's, it's not really used uh, that much. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, I, it, this is the kind of short uh, description of uh, the options, uh, but I have more, uh, uh, this, I, I have uh, more information in the report we, we will provide. Uh, I, I have the references if you need uh, for the implementation group. So kind of this is, uh, uh, if, you, if you have any questions about this uh, research, uh, please feel free. Uh, yeah. So for, for the group two, that's, that's all or you have more to, yeah, okay. Great, so thank you very much. Uh, I have some questions. So really solid work in terms of uh, researching the technologies and the different tools and the routing algorithms and, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm looking forward to check the, the report also. Um, I have the, uh, just a comment about the privacy and linkability. Uh, so some of those decisions are sort of 
really hard to do an isolation in either of the groups. You actually have to discuss them together because they both influence each other. So the way the users are identified and the way the trust is being established from the user perspective has very solid and direct influence on the implementation. And then some of the implementation choices also have, uh, you know, uh, in, in implications onto the, um, the user space. So for example, if the technology used is Bluetooth, then you can't really hide the connectivity of your Bluetooth device from your neighbor. Uh, whereas if your connectivity is uh, IP layer and Wi-Fi, you can use, as you were describing, go through ZeroNet or FreeNet or some other protocol layer of even Tor to obfuscate of what your IP address is and hide it. So depending on the technology choices, there are implications on the privacy and security and then the decisions on what should be secure, what should be hidden, have implications onto the, the rest of the system. Of course, you can have a, a layered approach. So as we were discussing about the layers of the OSI networking stack, what you could do is you could have a certain connectivity, let's say on Bluetooth, which is visible. So it's like a kind of a Mac layer where the devices kind of see each other but then everything else is wrapped into some sort of onion packets that it's hidden from them. So even though I know that I have a Bluetooth connectivity to a neighbor, I have no idea who that is. And on that layer, I kind of am isolating uh, what the information being exchanged is, and all the layers above it are kind of hidden from me. So even though I know that I have or neighbors which are blue, particular Bluetooth devices, I have no uh, a recognition of like on the high level application layer of who they are. So even if I'm routing something, I still treat them as anonymous and I don't know if the, if the messages are really to my neighbor or to somewhere else. So you can kind of uh, work out on the technology level certain, um, certain protocol stack which will hide some of the information, but yeah. Other than that, what I'm trying to say is that it's quite hard to do both objectives completely independent. They influence each other. So that was the linkability. I have a question about the Android development stack, the last slide you were discussing, um, because most of those tools are kind of a, a application development focused on the UI and focused on the presentation to the client. Yep. But the pre in the previous slide, we were discussing some libraries and some technologies used directly for implementing the protocol stack. Uh, for example, some zero knowledge proof library or private public key cryptography library. So yep. um, th there are kind of a two aspects to the app. So one is the, the kind of a client side, the presentation layer, and yeah. the technologies are described in the next slide. And one is this sort of the network stack, the networking layer and the kind of the... You mean the backend, right? Yeah, exactly, the backend yeah. side, yeah. So yeah, I, 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 yeah, I also uh, saw it and researched a little bit. I think uh, they have the, uh, the, the software guys um, have uh, more options like Java, Python, C Sharp, or I don't know, C++, whatever they want. Uh, other than PHP and Python, that's that's uh, what I saw. Like, I mean, yeah, I, I saw it like backend. Uh, they can be really flexible uh, on that. So, if you, if you want me to uh, research uh, on this uh, more and uh, give them like uh, about this, I, I can add to the report. No problem. Um, yeah. So, so I mean, the, the the work continues, right? So we're moving into stage two. So not everything needs to be done in stage one. Uh, what I would like you to kind of organize is kind of uh, distinguish between those two layers. So this slide is great for the sort of a front end and yeah. then for the back end and for the networking stack, even on the phone, uh, we need some technologies as well. So you can kind of uh, mention what has been already done, uh, organize it, and then what's the next stage? Like what is to be yeah. researched in the next couple of weeks? Um, yeah, no problem. I, I, uh, yeah, I don't think it takes that much time, so I can add it. So, yeah, that sounds great. I have um, 
suggestion also. It's a little bit to both groups um, because it's quite easy to uh, like a, a existing um, messaging apps often use phone number as a um, as an identifier. So it has two advantages. So one advantage is that people already have phone numbers in their contact lists. So if the app says, okay, there is this user with this phone number, I already know who that is because I have this person in my contact list, right? So it's kind of easier to establish trust. Um, the second reason why they do that is that people cannot do a civil attack. So I cannot create, you know, hundreds of identities uh, because I would need hundreds of phone numbers to do that. So because people typically have a limited number of phone numbers, they have a limited number of doing civil attacks. Uh, so then validating a person's phone number is kind of uh, a way to mitigate some of the potential abuse of the peer-to-peer -peer system. Um, and because our system is mobile, is based on mobile devices, it's kind of really natively easy to validate somebody's phone number because they can just send an SMS to you and then you say, oh yeah, you are who you say you are because I got an SMS from you, right? So even without using any trusted third party service, we can sort of validate people um, using SMS. Yes, that there are some problems with, with this. So uh, one, one problem is that um, phone numbers can be spoofed. So you can pretend to have a particular phone number and send an SMS with that phone number to pretend that you are who you say you are um, using some, some trickery. Um, so that's the problem. And the second problem is that by exposing your phone number, you're leaking some personal information. So there was a bit of a discussion on what is being leaked and what is not leaked, right? Again, it's kind of both from the tech side and from the user perspective side. Um, if the user requirements are not to leak IP address or not to leak personal phone number into the system, then that has re ramification into the rest of the design. So what I would like both groups to do is to clearly identify what are the user side implications of certain decisions that are being made. So at the end of the day, if the tech group decides to do a particular thing, what does it implies on the user end, on the kind of a semantic end of the app for the user, right? Um, so for example, if you decide to go with a plain Wi-Fi and you are leaking an IP address, what does it mean to the user? Or if you decide to go with zero net and then you are having a kind of a anonymity layer which hides certain things, again, what does it mean to the user? So always try to link it from the user perspective, what certain decisions kind of mean. Um, so some decisions, of course, like for example, with the technology choices, they are mostly for developers and they don't really have any implications to the user. Like if my app is React Native or if my app is in Flutter, for the end user apart from a little bit of maybe different user experience, there is no real implications in terms of privacy or security or the functionality of the app or what, what have you. But some choices do have those implications. So make sure that you in your reports that you kind of link it, okay? Um, Yes, I have, um, yeah, that, that's pretty much all for, from me. Any other people commenting on the presentations? Did you enjoy the presentations from each other? Like the group one enjoying group two and group two enjoying group one? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think it was good. Yeah. Um, have you have the tech group, the group which is uh, trying to implement learned new things that they haven't thought of? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm kind of, I have one question though. Um, yeah. 
uh, kind of like an open question, I guess, um, because now the tech technological group have uh, presented uh, a wide range of different technologies and algorithms and basically the decisions that has to be made. So I'm wondering now that when we start the implementation phase of the project, will we uh, be making these decisions uh, for ourselves for the implementation phase and will that uh, affect the technological spec for the next part? Or should we wait until some the, the decisions has been made completely or? Uh... No, so I, I think you should not wait. Uh, some of the decisions need to be collaborated on and coordinated. So for example, if you've already started, let's say, uh, prototyping something with Kotlin or with React Native, then you tell the tech group that, okay, you have a preference on this particular tech because you've already taken steps into that tech, right? Um, I, I don't think there is a kind of a clear chain of command, like who decides. I think it's um, the tech group has a certain more weight if you've already invested some time into certain tech uh, to, or if you have expertise in that tech to skew some of the decisions, but uh, you just need to discuss it. Um, and also there is no clear uh, chain of command between the user perspective and the tech perspective. Uh, so in general, what we want, we want something that is peer-to-peer, -peer, which is decentralized and something that is secure, but what it exactly means, uh, it's a little bit up for negotiation. So what I would, um, what we could do is um, to speed up the process because so some things can be decided now, some things still need a bit more research. Uh, so even if you, for example, decide to go with a particular ta tech stack and with particular crypto libraries, uh, you still may need to kind of uh, identify exactly how the protocol works or how the routing works or how the gossip or flooding works. And that doesn't need to be decided right now. It can be decided, you know, in the stage two. But some things should be decided now based on the research everybody did, such that the project can continue. Um, what can and should not be decided now, it's a little bit of a uh, on case basis. Like uh, what we could do is we, so for next week, let's do this. Uh, all groups will kind of finish the reports and upload them to the wiki. And then you will make a proposal uh, into what is clear, what should be chosen and what is still a little bit unclear of exactly what should be chosen or what should be done. And then for the clear parts, next week we're gonna make all the decisions, okay? So we kind of freeze kind of a feature stack and then move on to, to stage two with some of the base already frozen. So uh, we don't have to kind of repeat the whole cycle in stage two, we just move forward. Does it make sense? Um, I have a question for the Feynman group. So yeah. that, uh, we finished the stage one. Uh, how are we going to communicate with the other groups for stage two? Because the, it's, it's going to be the last stage, right? We cannot wait until the end of the stage to give them the information. Then it will be like kind of useless. So uh, what are we going to do now? And how are we going to communicate with the other groups in this stage? Yeah, so what I'm suggesting is that the groups will finish the reports and then as part of the finishing the reports, we'll make a list of the decisions which are kind of uh, based on the work done so far. So for example, you have some very well-defined outcomes which are already clear and then you put that into the first part. And then the second part will be all the still undecided things which need the second stage to be clarified, right? So everything that can be decided now, you do in this week and you prepare it as part of the report. Uh, so you say, we suggest this, 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 we suggest going with this particular requirements and so on. And then the second part will be left uh, as more optional. Um, and then because you, you both do that, there might be some conflicts 
or they might be kind of an, an easy merge, right? So what we will do next week, we will meet and we will do this merge process. We will solidify what is clearly common and what is decided, and then what is left for the stage two research. And then groups again start working on the part which is uh, not done yet. Okay. Does it make so sense? Mean we have until next week to finish up the reports, right? We That's correct. Yeah. So so let's let's have until next week to finish the reports and solidify the um, the decisions. But let's not uh, like if if you guys could do it by Friday, that probably be better because then everybody could use Monday to read it and kind of be prepared for the Tuesday session to make this merge process. Okay. So how about having Friday a deadline for the reports to be on the wiki? And then Monday, we will kind of use to read through it and prepare ourselves. And then on Tuesday, we will meet and we will kind of freeze the feature set, which will be frozen. And then the rest will continue to be, to be researched. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I can see some thumbs ups and some okays. Yeah, the tech worked. Anybody had any problems with the voice or video? No problems? All right, so um, I will check if we can reuse the same link. If not, I will post on the wiki um, a new Zoom link for the meeting. Um, and I will try to make it permanent such that we can reuse the same link for the con uh, consecutive meetings. And then we meet next week on Tuesday at 10.15 again. I will start at, at around 10 um, to make this kind of a group process of finalizing the decisions which are kind of, um, which we will freeze for the second stage. Sounds good? Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I really enjoyed it and it was uh, well done. So all good. See you next week then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.